everybody. It is Patrick McLean, as you know, one of your guests here for Reimagine 2020. Still rocking the Mario hat. We have the Halloween theme, Tales from the Crypto. I know everybody knows this guy. I think I've done long intros every time, but I'll just go straight to it. And I enjoy talking to this guy. It's the fourth time we talked in months. It's become one of my most favorite people. Craig, how's your day going? What's the highlight? What's been the highlight of your week? This is my question I always ask you. Um, let's see. My week's been uh, not too bad. It's uh, end of uh, sort of semester for some of the things I'm doing. Um, uh, work is fine, although it's Zoom calls are getting beyond annoying. Um, I mean, generally things are going quite well. Uh, finished the first semester of my uh, sort of uh, politics studies that I'm doing. Uh, did very well in them. Sort of understand how crazy people are, even if I don't agree. Last time we talked, you said you were starting like the next round of schools, kind of on different hours, I think, and doing it remotely or whatever. But how, how has that been going for you? Oh, very well. Um, having lots of fun with uh, a few Marxist professors. Uh, they um, gave me uh, feedback saying that, um, stating that capitalism is the only source of growth. Um, well, uh, is a logical fallacy and um, that uh, that detracts from sort of my essay. Now, they, they basically said that um, uh, using absolutes is, uh, is wrong and you shouldn't do it. Now, my answer back was that stating that all absolutes are incorrect is itself an absolute. So you're creating your own black or white fallacy by saying that you cannot have black or white um, so therefore, you've actually done the same fallacy that you have accused me of. However, there is another fallacy, which is middle of the road or golden mean fallacy, where you say that truth is neither A or B, but it must always lie in the middle of two arguments, which is actually itself not always true. So the correct answer would have been to say, ha, you're wrong. There's actually this sort of system here that is an alternative to capitalism and creates growth and property rights. I mean, you could also argue that property rights don't matter and growth doesn't matter, but that would not discount my argument that the only system that creates growth. The argument would be, we don't so wait, care wait, about- Wait, 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 one second. So you're, what you're trying to tell me is you're their favorite student. Uh, most hated would probably be. My <laughs> 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 I have a dartboard with my picture up there, like many others. But you, but you, but you feel like you have like a stance in your position, and you want to translate it. Even um, well, if it's logically sound, then I mean, and unfortunately, there are a lot of people in this postmodern sort of world that we're now in that like to believe that. Truth doesn't matter. Rational thought don't, doesn't matter. And that's completely erroneous. The world doesn't care whether you believe. The world acts and continues and will happily mow you down whether you believe it or not. So if someone wanted to act more rationally today, what would be a step they could take? Like an easy, low-hanging fruit, something that you commonly see? Um, I don't necessarily believe in, in low hanging fruit. What I, I'd say is you start the initial or, or step. First, or first going. step, yeah, 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 sorry. So actually learning um, sort of philosophy, a little bit about rational thought uh, is a good start. Learn logic, start to understand what people are saying, uh, sort of start to question things, look at uh, conceptions such as um, contradictions. The first thing to remember here is there are no such things as contradictions in this world. If there's a contradiction, then that means something's wrong. If categorically there is a contradiction, then there's an error in one of the premises. So you have to go back and reevaluate. It doesn't matter whether we're talking mathematics, science, philosophy, art. If there's a contradiction, then something is in error. Contradictions can't prove flaw in design. Why not? 
they can or cannot? A contradiction can't prove it. It can uh, prove uh, through negation. So if you demonstrate that something is in contradiction, it's contradictory, then you know that it's false. So this is common in mathematical thought where you basically have a proof by um, uh, contradiction, where you actually uh, prove condition A by contradicting the alternative. I'm gonna stop myself there before I get embarrassed because I feel like that's what'll happen next. Thanks for letting me out on that. All right, I have something I wanna talk about because I mm -hmm. like talking to you. We were just chatting before, like I was asking you how life was in the UK. I think maybe it kind of plays in what you're saying, the decisions people are making, the logic that they're following. Uh, yeah what's contradictory, maybe what they expect to be happening and what they're experiencing. Can you give me the Craig Wright? I want the Craig Wright State of the Union. Like where you think the world is right now, both where you're at geogra geographically and then what you might anticipate is happening other places. Okay, so the simple answer is it has its head up its ass. To put that in, into a different context is we are – beholden to fear. We're looking at something that is not as potent as it is, and we're making it into an incredibly large and dangerous thing that shouldn't be. So we're sitting there going, we'll get a, uh, a cure that will never come. And we're, we're putting everything on that, not looking at things factually, not looking at where we'll end up, not actually evaluating things logically and rationally, which goes back to my initial point. We've discarded rationality and we've created this postmodern world of romanticized sort of atavistic um, primitivism. Can you, can, you, can you kind of maybe like bring it down like a level or two? Like, can you get maybe uh, some specific examples of things you see? So what I was going to dem uh, sort of get to is, as an example, we look at uh, the rate of sort of people dying and contracting COVID and saying, it's all about protecting these elderly people. And they will say that there is a possibility that if they get it, it could be up to 7.5% of people over the age of, of 80 die in, in contracting COVID. Now, that means that's if a particular person gets it, they have a 7.5% chance. Yet, let's compare statistics. If we look at males over the age of 80, 15.2 to 15.3% of those people will die. Full stop. The normal everyday death rate in Britain is around just over 15.2% of males over the age of 80 will die in any given year. If you start thinking about that, it makes sense because not many people live to 300, none that I know of. So this concept of keeping people alive beyond keeping them alive is ridiculous. And when we're doing the analysis of has this person died from COVID or not? We're not actually considering whether that person died without or would have died in the year without COVID. So we're sitting there going, 7.5% of people will die, which is half the figure of people that will die. So how many of those people have actually died that would have died COVID or not? And the interesting thing here is, that no one's pointing out, there is an R squared correlation figure between the distribution of deaths by age and the distribution of COVID deaths of 98%. That means age accounts for 98% of the distribution, which is unheard of in science. You don't get 98% correlations unless you're comparing the same thing. So what we're looking at is whether you're 15, 50, or 80, we're sitting there going, everyone's dying of COVID. Everyone's not dying of COVID. Everybody's following fairly much 
a normal death rate and COVID's being attributed. And are there, and I've read certain things about like, do you think that there are longer term effects that are like lingering effects, things, reasons to be worried that aren't measured in immediacy of death? I have seen no good scientific evidence. So, okay, so then let's talk about the other side. Like, so you're, you're essentially advocating for a less restrictive quarantine economic border I'm, control policy. I'm saying and, and that every dollar that is diverted from an economy causes suffering and death. When we're in a state that we are now, where we are not crippling, but permanently paralyzing aspects of society, we are going to completely decimate part of the population. Not old people. We are going to destroy education, which we're doing. That and, will... and that is, and that's, and that's the move to Zoom. Yeah, we're not teaching people properly. People are not going to school. Right now, the number of teenage boys who are engaged in crime has um, tripled. Basically, these are, are students who just no longer go to school. Why? Because no one knows. So whenever they do these sort of lockdowns, it just utterly decimates education. And I'm not exaggerating on that one either. So we have now a scenario where a fear on something is causing real consequences, not COVID as a consequence, not this one in um, a thousand chance of actually um, getting sick and dying, forgetting that the 88 slash 89 flu killed uh, between 800 and uh, 100, uh, 800,000 and 1.6 million people, uh, forgetting that the uh, 2008 flu um, killed at least 800,000 people, and no one even remembers these. Forgetting so, that well, well, the whole COVID so, so, thing that we have now was a weekly death rate for the uh, the one in the 1920s. I mean, everyone's comparing this, but the weekly death rate in the 1920s for the flu exceeded everyone who's died over the last nine months and everyone who's been hospitalized weekly. All right. So I want to I, I wanna try to slowly pivot off this one. So you don't go to... I definitely, I think there's a lot of other things I want to talk about, but I do want to close this out on this point mm. to maybe ask why you think this is happening. If it's so obvious, if the math is so obvious. And I'm looking at your blog right now. Uh, I, was, I was reading some stuff earlier, kind of catch up. And an article you wrote on September 21st, uh, CraigWright.net, if anybody hasn't seen it. But it's titled Undermining Truth, The Rise of Fake News. So do you think that there is, like, why aren't people, if it's so obvious, why aren't people catching what you're saying? We, um, that is actually a good um, sort of uh, counterpoint to my argument. Uh, but really what it is, is we have a fake news society. So if you look at how that really works, have we got the truth being propagated? And I'll argue that, because of um, big tech right at the moment, how it is, we haven't. We have um, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all of this sitting there going, oh, we only, um, uh, we have a policy of only promoting X or Y or whatever else. And they're act absolutely, completely disingenuous. Um, as a, a perfect case study, uh, Twitter, for instance, Twitter have said that they won't uh, allow anything to be disseminated that is obtained from hackers or false news or whatever else. They have said that um, some of the information about um, Biden and um, uh, negative uh, documents that um, uh, our presidential candidate um, Joe Biden um, uh, would have have been repressed because they came from hackers. Yet here's the count, the um, sort of alternative to that. My account was shut down not because I was selling cryptocurrency illegally, I didn't, not because I was promoting lies, but because I said something that was opposed by um, the founder of Twitter 
And on top of that... What, what did you say exactly? I mean, for everybody um, that doesn't know. Basically, I described what Bitcoin really is. And they don't want that. I used logic and facts at many times. And you this. tweeted at Jack Dorsey or replied to Jack Dorsey? No, I just generally did it. I mean, the fact that I, I didn't even involve him, I don't really care about him. Um, so yet there are hundreds of accounts that still exist and are allowed to promote a whole lot of information about me that is completely false, that is obtained through hacked documents that have been modified. It's, 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 it's completely selective bullshit. And actually, I'll give you, I'll give you an answer. I'll give you a perfect response. Mm -hmm. For anyone that doesn't know, the other day, Facebook straight wiped the reimagined face 2020 Facebook account off of Facebook. Mm -hmm. 35,000 people attending events and then like version 3.0 event had like 12,000 people literally just shut it off. Took six days to even reply to us from support. Mm -hmm. Then just turned it back on. And the part that really made me laugh is that we had like, I don't know, some small ad testing running like 75 bucks is nothing. But when they turned it on, like you can here, you can have your account back. Didn't even tell us no justification. We didn't do anything wrong. And then started running our ads as soon as they turned our account on. Like here, you can, you're now allowed to have your account back with no uh, clarification as of why. And we're going to start billing you until you pause it. But mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but actually to validate your point, there's so many scammy, pages twitter pages facebook pages people promoting their own projects not really clarifying they're doing it craig mm -hmm. wright should have a twitter for anyone listening i, I didn't I mean to interrupt you. <laughs> um, but here's the point this whole scenario completely utterly suits these organizations amazon um have made billions Facebook have made billions. Twitter have made billions. Why? Because people are using Amazon more to, to shop. They're not going out. So that's great for Amazon. People are uh, using these things rather than working. They're basically becoming platforms that are replacing many of the aspects of society we had before. And this whole lockdown scenario actually increases the amount of not only political, but this power in general that these organizations have. So why would they want to do anything other than create fake news? Why would they want to promote ideas of discussion? I mean, scientific discussion means you have people who say, no, I disagree with climate change. For instance, um, the Roman economy actually mirrors um, sort of climate. And if you look at, um, sort of the growth of the Roman uh, Republic and then the fall of the empire, they happen based on uh, an increase of temperature and then a decrease in temperature. You can look at um, the fact that people argue we're in the warmest time since 1300, but that means it was warmer in 1300. And you can state these things. And these are hist uh, histological facts. So, and you can debate saying, what was the climate like in 1300 and before? What was the world like? What was agriculture like? And their proper debates saying, oh, climate's bad, we've got to stop growth. That's actually not a logical debate. Saying, what is our alternative? What is the economically rational choice? If climate is a problem, what can we do? Do we stop growth? which results in death. There's no alternative here. If you slow growth, people starve. So let's see. If there is a problem and sea levels rise, what can we do as an alternative? How much will that cost as an alternative? What time frame? And even the worst case scenarios, um, if you take somewhere like Florida, for instance, where people complain about, oh, my waterfront property or whatever else, then the cost to doing something on the economy is something like 12 times more expensive than reacting by building levies, creating um, uh, control programs, 
and acting over the 30 year period. And everyone sits there going, but no one will do this. Why won't they? If you look throughout history, people have done this and more wealth, more growth allows us to have a world where it becomes simpler to do this. That's the Craig Wright State of the Union. Mm -hmm. so anyone actually. listening, pay, pay, I, I asked actually someone else I respect yesterday, kind of the same thing. I don't know if you know him, guy, Mark Yusko. You'd be surprised. You should listen to what he says after the interview. I think he's a good guy. I think he actually, a lot of what you just said, it pretty mirrored. I think there's a general consensus of something going on right now. Isn't, doesn't talk, like, doesn't quite jive, but let's, I want to pivot to actually something. I think, and I've said it a few times before, I always think that I personally think you're highly misunderstood in this space. I'll just lead with that. And I'm always amazed at how much you hate corruption and all this stuff. I think last time we talked, you were really calling out like a lot of the DeFi projects. Mm. Um, I kind of watched the reaction to that and it was very interesting. I would say I almost saw like 40, 50% of people really be like, I don't know about Craig Wright, but I really agree with this point, right? So, and I think actually over that time period, I think we talked in August, like a lot of that fell apart. And I was actually joking the other day. People were like, I'm pretty, it seems like Craig actually had some pretty decent points to the naysayers. And I've heard you talk about like exchanges and things like that. Um, some of kind of the back room deals you've seen. Um, so I was actually asking like one of my friends today, his thoughts, someone I think has a pretty unique perspective, maybe beyond mine. Um, but I think if we kind of look at like, and I'm sure you see all like the story on like the BitMEX uh, team kind of getting indicted or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And and some of the, and we can kind of want to get your thoughts on that. And then I think like, and, I, and I'll read a little bit, like kind of what my friend told me, it was just like they, that for a while, for many years, people have seen like large wicks in Bitcoin price, right? Like where prices are moving up 10%, up and mm -hmm. down in minutes. It was like they, people had theory. I've lost your voice. Uh, sorry, guys, my headphones died. So here's my here was the point I was making. Uh, Craig will validate letter. Nothing crazy got edited up. My friend's telling me that after the BitMEX thing, this is stopped. Mm. And so it's leading people to believe that like BitMEX was maybe behind it. Um, so what are your thoughts on that in general? Like, do you feel like you're going to kind of be vindicated and like regulations are coming down on people. Do you have any thoughts on like the BitMEX thing and the other, any other rep revelation? I don't think BitMEX are big enough to have done that. So, um, nor do they have the volume, etc. cetera. Um, rather there are lots of other players in this market. Um, after the BitMEX thing, this has slowed and hasn't stopped. Well, I mean, that's basically people sitting and, awaiting what's going to happen next. So uh, that's a false cause, uh, uh, basically making correlation into um, causation. So the simple answer here is BitMEX are correlation. Other individuals who do this have limited the amount of trading that they're doing and manipulation that they're doing because they know that they're being watched. Right now, we have the period where uh, the government is starting to act. I said a while ago that it can take um, six or seven years for government to finally come down and start acting on things. This is now the period of six or seven years. BitMEX have been around that long. Uh, well, not quite, but close enough. Uh, we're seeing the early mixes now being taken down. People who've been involved in coin mixing since 2013 are now facing uh, criminal charges. And that's only going to continue. The mistaken belief is that they'll get a few of the early ones and that it'll stop. They won't. They will come down harder and harder. If everything stops and it cleans up, then it's likely government will get bored and go away. But anything in the future is going to get more and more um, sort of regulated. What will happen is once government gets a few precedents, once they have all this through court, then they will use those basically as the hammer and the anvil. And they will use their precedents 
and they'll use the action and they'll start comparing. And it makes it simpler. It makes it less expensive. And it makes the amounts that they can get bigger because then they can start arguing that this is well known. This is something that the industry is not disputing. After all, the court has already decided this and these people are still continuing to act knowingly. Instead of $60 million, they're going to start going for $600 million and $6 billion. And over time, the criminal sanctions are going to get not a little slap on the wrist, but as they go, they're going to build on them. And people are going to get 20 year sentences and people are going to get multiple sentences. And people like Mr. McAfee are going to, well, die in prison. How do you how do you feel about that? I mean, I, well, him specifically, it sounds like he thought he had it coming to him. Hmm. Um, everyone loves to run around going, um, John McAfee, the cre creator of McAfee. John didn't create McAfee. Well, he created the company. He didn't create the software. He wasn't the coder or developer or anything like that. He's one of these people who managed to take an idea created by someone else uh, locked the person who actually created the software out, or people, um, and flimflam his way into getting his software installed uh, freely as sort of um, ransomware on everyone's computer. And he made money out of that. He, his new model was a ransomware thing where it basically uh, caused problems on your computer unless you paid to have it removed. So early versions of McAfee were horrible things. All right. So then what? Like, you just think this is like, they're all, the government's going to come down on all of these products. Like, the wild west of crypto is over. BitMEX, do you think BitMEX is like a shining light that this is like warning shot at people, like you said, to establish precedent? Um, warning shot, no. This is just the first preamble into more. Um, what they're doing is they're, they're using this as a test case to see what they need to do better. Uh, BitMEX aren't even the biggest. I mean, there will be bigger ones, but they won't go after the biggest ones first. The history of how these things work is you, you pick someone who's known, but not too big. You don't want them actively being able to fight or um, disappear or basically interfere with getting your initial judgment. Wait, wait. So, so who are the big? Who are the big ones then? Who's next? Like, who is the oh, top? I, I, I mean, I couldn't tell you who's next, but there are plenty who are big. I mean, um, like, who do you think the big fish are? Like, if you're saying Bitmex is a small player in the chain. Oh, look at all the guys in Tether. I mean, this is actively creating a false version of U.S. dollar. Um, I mean, there's actually legal sort of ramifications to making a, a US dollar coin. Ask some of the early guys in Bitcoin who um, tried doing similar things. Um, Tether's going to go down big time. I mean, then you've got um, a lot of the other exchanges like um, uh, Binance and things like this. Um, Binance are basically a bunch of criminals that sit there promoting money laundering for the sake of it. Um, you have a number of the other sort of Asian exchanges. Um, they sit there operating on US servers, US domains, uh, and arguing, but we're not US. Guess what? If you're a .com, you're US. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. That's a good question I actually passed on from a friend. And, and I, I think people are... It appears people are seeing less games being played since the BitMEX thing. So whatever the correlation is might be temporary. Uh, that's what I'm hearing uh, from some friends. But so Basically, people are just a little bit afraid of what might happen at the moment, and they're uncertain. Yeah. So like they're everyone back everyone, everyone pulled back. They, 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 yes. uh, yeah, I got you. It's that's like when you see the policeman come and arrest someone, you drive better. Even if right, <laughs> you, you stay within the speed limit. You've seen the guy go down the highway with his uh, siren on. 
so you start watching you start, you, start wa- you start watching your rear view mirror as you drive like uh, exactly and you watch your speed limit i mean uh, it's just a natural phenomena i mean you've been doing 10 That's over right. the speed limit a cop goes by nothing to do with you suddenly you start driving in the speed limit and checking your mirrors and doing all the yeah this answer makes perfect sense to me um, the, all right, the so- irony there is people don't even realize that sometimes cops just go down the highway to cause that effect yeah. So one of the things is by being seen. There's a, there's a joke of the dummy, the dummy cop car cut out, like the cardboard cut out. That <laughs> looks like that looks like a. In Tokyo, they have the the police, like the the robot policeman with like the hmm. the little twirling light thing, but they're robot cutouts, like. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just but, a but, reminder but it, to act. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, just, just a reminder how to act. So, yeah. hmm. We all need that reminder from time to time. So hey, I, I wanted to kind of pivot here. Um, so again, I was reading your your blog the other day, and uh, I think the article that kind of called out to me the most, kind of having a theme here of tales of the crypto. So I think this might tie in a little bit. Uh, but an article you wrote is the myth of Bitcoin as a voting system. Mm. Um, I want to kind of get your perspective here, and and from what I understand, a lot of this is derived from section four of the white paper, the proof of work section. Is that accurate? In regards um, to tying tying into voting. At a high level, yeah, it's more than just that. People, uh, sure, but 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 t- yeah. take us in. So, I mean, if you don't mind, I can, can I read a few parts in the beginning of the article? Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, so to say, this is written by Craig. There lies an it lies an error in many people's fundamental understanding of Bitcoin and any blockchain system mm-hmm. that has been propagated by those who seek to hide the power grab they are making behind a false patina of democracy. Oh, I'm reading this horribly. Some of the people associated with Bitcoin Core and Blockstream have begun arguing that the worst decision was voting in Gavin to run the system after myself, Gavin mm-hmm. and Dreesen. There are multiple flaws in their argument. Firstly, I wasn't ever voted into the system. I created Bitcoin and I didn't give over the control of the protocol. Next, Gavin was not appointed by vote or by the community. I selected Gavin to manage the software distribution. His job was to steward the software to ensure that it had no problems. It was not a role where he was designated to change the protocol. So I'll, I'll, I'll not butcher your words, mm-hmm. but can you kind of tell us a little bit for the audience, maybe in, in how you would describe this more simply, or it, it seems like you tried to, um, and why you think it, that it matters? So first of all, you can't vote with a blockchain. You can have voting systems that record results on a blockchain, but there is no such thing as a blockchain voting system. Nodes basically need some way of announcing themselves. Now, I described this in the Bitcoin white paper saying, we could have all these machines acting with separate IP addresses, but that would allow Sybils. Sybils are attackers that pretend that they basically a doppelgangers replacing individuals. They're acting as if they're real nodes when they're not. So you're not voting in Bitcoin. You're voting very simply with either A, I'm going to follow the system honestly and enforce the rules, or B, I'm going to attack the system. And if you attack the system, then you must know that you're advertising your IP address, your location, and all of the things that make you easy to find as an attacker. More importantly, you're now basically saying, I'm an attacker, I'm committing a crime, and I have this investment that can be sequestered, taken by a court, and reallocated. So, I have invested hundreds of millions of dollars and I'm going to attack the the network with people knowing that they can recover against me. That's the choice. So it's not a real choice. And can you give just like, if you want, like 60 seconds, 120 seconds, condensed background. for anyone that doesn't know, like when you say I gave, or I'll read the next bulleted point, what Adam Back and others forgot is they didn't vote Gavin in. I yes, appointed like, him. So can you just give people for like the two minute version, like I wrote the Bitcoin white paper, da, 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 like just for cliff notes. 
Well, yeah, I created Bitcoin, but the thing that people are saying is one of the worst, like Adam Back came out and said one of the worst things that happened to Bitcoin was when they voted Gavin in, which is completely fallacious. There's no voting Gavin in. Nobody voted Gavin in. I didn't approach anyone. I didn't have a poll. I didn't decide. I basically had Gavin and said, you're taking over this aspect. Go for it. It was, it was a unilateral decision. It was completely my decision. So said, why, why, why are they convoluting that then, in your opinion? Or is that, is that a strategic to, convolution? They, they, it is very strategic. They want you to believe that it is some system where the community votes. So Bitcoin Core, there are three people who hold the keys to the GitHub repository. Yet what they like you to believe is that anybody can actually propose code and that the community decides. The reality is this small oligarchy sits there and tells you how the community thinks. But there's no independent sort of anonymous view of this. The party and that's hierarchy- how, That's how it was supposed to be? And that's how no, you think it should be? No, I, I didn't want any change. So there's no voting, there's no deciding because the protocols there go away. There's no power over the protocols because it's set. So if you don't have an ability to change something, you have no power. So the way I took away power out of the system was basically to set and structure it so that it just happens. So I guess then let's, so then if I follow this story, it's that you think did Gavin do a poor job? I actually don't know much about the story. I, I know a little bit, but I'm going to like, I'm going to read it. I might help the audience. What was the problem with Gavin? Why did he become controversial? Gavin was hounded and Gavin, Gavin doesn't have enough um, sort of resilience to support himself against these others who were basically constantly attacking him. So he caved into the peer pressure that he was facing. Lots of people out there kept going, you need to do this, you need to do that. I had it all the time. Um, and I went away to do other things and that was my caving. So Gavin needed to stand up and go, no. And it's hard to say no. I mean, I, I perfectly well know how hard it can be when you've got a lot of pr uh, pressure to say, no, this is not how it's gonna happen. I'm standing my ground. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, I'm not moving. This is the line. That's it. And that's difficult. So I don't- And, see, and, and part of the arguments were around anonymity from what I understand? Yes. So this all came with the Electronic Frontier Foundation and their whole invention of um, Bitcoin being a uh, sort of censorship resistant system and whatever else, uh, which was really in aid of funding WikiLeaks and a whole lot of other things that uh, the government didn't like. And there's no actual factual basis to, to any of the arguments. If you actually pull it apart rationally and logically, uh, you, you find it falls apart. I mean, the first sort of change in a blockchain system wasn't Ethereum. Everyone argues Ethereum made this change and rolled back the chain, therefore X. Except the problem there is the first one was me. Bitcoin was rolled back by me. So if you go back to 2010, um, there were changes implemented by me. The whole chain, when we had a, a, um, an overflow problem, uh, like there was actually a, a sort of many more Bitcoin than should exist problem. Code errors, what can we say? Not protocol, shit code. Um, then wait, wait, wait. People write, people make errors when they write code. I've never heard that before. I thought all code right. just came out first pass, perfect, on time, under budget. I thought that's how it worked. Oh yeah, always. Yeah, uh, yeah, completely. No one ever needs to go do code analysis. And of course, I used to do security code reviews, um, so I could never make a mistake on my own code. I mean, because someone who picks out faults in other people's codes will never make uh, faults himself. Yeah, that's what people are, that's the best strategy. The person that QAs the code is supposed to be the person that writes it. That usually produces the best results.
Exactly, because you know where your own problems are and you'll never, never make them. I mean, yeah. I mean, what really happens is you look at your own code and you completely miss all the errors because it's your code and you go, that bit's good and you skip over it and you get this bit that you think you had problems on and you go, ah, there's my, my completely innocuous uh, error that I've fixed, I've done great, and you roll it out and it fails. So I, I'm just kind of going back to Sonico because I, I really do think it's an interesting story and I kind of want to get to like the point of maybe why you thought it was important to write about this the other day. Um, so is this, do you frame this Gavin? So like Gavin's getting pressure, seems like anonymity is one of the big sticking points or the motivations for people to apply this pressure. Uh, if you would go back, you would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you would have selected someone with that could handle more pressure, I guess. Uh, to, I would to have to stay there myself. I mean, my... You're just, you're just asshole enough to tell people no. I'm the same way. I'll be like, I'll tell you. Well, no, I am I'll now. Play. I wasn't then. Um, <laughs> so I you thought you, thought you needed one. someone else. Like You thought it wasn't a role for you. You thought there was someone yeah, that could fight I mean, that battle better than you. So, I mean, I, I've mentioned before, I have Asperger's. Um, it's taken me a lot of training and whatever else to be able to talk the way I do. And even now I have problems. Um, uh, I don't realize when I'm raising my voice, sometimes I get excited and, um, and people go, you're yelling at me. And I'm going, no, I'm not. I'm not angry. I'm happy. And they're going, yes, but this is how you react. You know, I don't even know. Um, I've seen myself in videos of how I talk and sometimes I just don't realize it. It's one of the little problems of sort of uh, autism spectrum. Sometimes um, people need, sometimes it's good to, sometimes people need to hear your voice raised, trust me. Not, not always, but it's still, it's still a relevant skill. Um, I agree. Uh, so I've, I've worked on that, but I've still got a long way to go. But um, it's completely different when you're considering something like code and mathematics. I mean, you can make mistakes in code and make mistakes in math, but it's fairly much a binary outcome. When you make a sort of predicate-based system, it's true or it's false or it's just crap. I mean, there's no other sort of middle ground. It's very simple in deciding. Whereas um, when you're describing something in real life, uh, people can reread what you've said in different ways. I mean, I, I gave evidence in court last week and I, I made a statement and people said, uh, came back and went, this is what you mean. And I had to go, no, actually, exactly what I said is what I mean. I'm not conflating anything else. I'm not saying anything else. It is this exact statement. I did this. This is the outcome, etc. But other people can read things into statements or read them differently. Words have different meaning. They've evolved over time. So th this is a, uh, a concept I was also talking about with um, some people I know in the US last week, um, talking about the US Constitution and uh, with the new sort of appointments to the um, um, sort of Supreme Court that are sort of underway, um, the idea of originalism. Now, some people say that we need to read the Constitution as the original founding fathers in the US. Um, I don't actually disagree. I'll state that up front. But to do that doesn't mean that you read it today with a dictionary written yesterday and say, this is what it means. For many of the words actually have different contexts and different meanings. What we take, for instance, as a militia, uh, say in the second uh, sort of amendment, or some of the words in the Establishment Clause have completely different meanings today than they did 200 years ago. I mean, a militia, for instance, was the body of men who can serve um, as an armed force. It didn't, that's not what we would think of now. You would be described as part of the militia um, to someone in the 18th century. You're able-bodied, you're healthy, you can pick up a gun and be sent to fight. You can defend your family. That makes you part of an active militia. If you're at the gym, you're part of an active militia. So, but that's not how people read militia today. Militia would be a guerrilla force or 
uh, something like this. So we have completely different takes on words um, that have evolved over 200 years. So. I got you. Um, but hey, I, I, I know, we're, I feel like this, I love this interview and I, I know we're covering like a wide range of topics. So I want to try to keep on like this point just a little bit. I want to kind of wrap up this story because I think it's yeah. interesting when I, when I read your, your blog post. So Gavin, you vote, you unilaterally appoint Gavin. Gavin yes. is falling under some pressure and that pressure ultimately leads to what outcome? Oh, uh, basically um, the changes that people wanted to start making into uh, Bitcoin were allowed to be initiated. The concepts, I mean, if right back at the beginning, you, uh, Gavin had simply said, look, no, we're not doing it. Find a way to do this in, uh, in the protocol as it is. Then and, 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 and actually for the people that don't understand, and I want to pull out this point, and you're talking about, for anyone that doesn't understand, there's a paper, Bitcoin white paper, Craig saying he wrote it. There's a section four, I think this refers to, right? Proof of work. Well, this and no, I, proof and of work is actually different to the voting system. People will um, sort of analogize to be the same, but anyway. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Well, I mean, do, do you actually want to, do you mind talking about the sections that you think were defined? Because it sounds like what you're telling me is that Gavin should have told everyone these are the parameters fit within them, correct? That is correct, yes. I mean, I had stated- so What, what, what um, were the parameters? Well, basically, um, when I set up Bitcoin in the early days, I said, look, it's set in stone. The protocol doesn't change. Yet people sit there going, oh, we can change this and change that. Well, no, you can't. Then it's not Bitcoin anymore. So if you want to do this, you can set up Litecoin and you can set up Ethereum and then you're not passing off as Bitcoin. If you're calling yourself Bitcoin, but you're adding Schnorr and you're going, we need to change this algorithm to make it faster, or we need to X, Y, Z, then you're not talking about Bitcoin anymore. Once you make those changes, you're talking about an alternative system. The whole point in being set in stone is it doesn't change. And it is not the sort of non-commercial nature of the internet that made the internet big. It is the commercial nature coupled with the fact it didn't change. TCPIP was static. That was an incredibly important aspect of how the internet actually took off. People overlook this. They sit there going, it's all about anarchists and all these other people. Then the mythology is wrong. Uh, I was there. I, I sort of remember right back from the 1980s. The, the internet back in the 80s was nothing. The internet is a series of commercial networks that basically took over. It's nothing to do with this mythology of military and all these other things. It's commercial. It's not anarchists. It was all about a commercial group um, of people wanting to connect their various networks, allowing them to access each other's systems and not having to change all the time. So Novell, killed itself. It, it was incredibly powerful for a time. Novell networks could have been the internet if they didn't go from version three to changing binary to version four to 4.1 to five and flip-flop every year, which was the really the, the business model, the same as IBM's now, which is we sell consulting. We're a software company, but we're here to sell you consulting. So people would install Nobel, and then a year later, they'd have to completely re-break down their organization because they weren't even properly backward compatible, reinstall a completely new network, spend all the money uh, with Nobel and consultants and everything like that in this enforced sort of um, regime of extracting money out of companies. And eventually companies said, screw it. I don't want to do this. I don't want to spend my money every year when there are alternatives that don't change. So all of this mythology about the internet uh, being anarchist and free, whatever else, is complete BS. 
the internet isn't anarchical at all. There is no, I get to change the protocol. Sorry, once it's set, it happens. So, okay, well, there was, well, you might say that there's no, I don't get to change the protocol, but it sounds like there was. So Gavin backs down is but what it sounds like the next act and what does he back down to and what and then how long does it take and what gets implemented? Uh, it started with small changes. Most of these things become exponential. And there was, was the first thing. change your your first sign like when they t- made the uh, first change where you're like it's all downhill from here kind of. Um, I had other problems at the time. I mean, um, uh, I had family problems. Um, I had uh, a lawsuit against the tax office in Australia that I eventually won. Um, they, the tax office were trying to bankrupt me because uh, if they could bankrupt me, that would stop me from uh, actually fighting them. Uh, because if you go bankrupt, they appoint a receiver who manages your affairs. And the tax office would have been able to appoint a friendly receiver to their goals who would shut down my uh, lawsuit, meaning that everything they've done becomes valid. Unfortunately for them, what really happened was I managed to survive long enough that they didn't get to bankrupt me. And the court actually found in my favor. And uh, then it turned out that the tax I had underclaimed and I got more money than I originally wanted. So the irony is so the tax did office... They reimb- did they reimburse your legal fees? No. Unfortunately, uh, you never get 100% of your legal fees. So it, uh, this is the problem. I ended up um, going well backwards because of that. So you're, you're busy at the time. And then so changes start to get made. And then, like, what's the next? This kicks off. Like, at what point? So I, I read the title of this, which is The Myth of Bitcoin as Voting. It sounds like you're pretty clear that it was a unilateral decision to appoint Gavin. There was never a dispute There's about that. But unilateral decisions in Bitcoin. There's no community vote ever. There's no system to community vote. I mean, think about it for a moment. Everyone sits there going, oh, well, the community decides. How? We don't have hive minds. People don't do that. There's no voting system here that is uh, provable in decision. So you're sitting there going, hash power. Well, that's three companies. I mean, they could stop using it, I guess. Like, they could vote with their wallets. Like, how people protest uh, brands. No. Except that's where the value is and the price was going up. So So I I, want to kind of wrap this part up. So I guess I I just want to bring it back to, like, the main point. Like, why why were you compelled to write this? What was it about this moment? And, like, if you were to box it up for maybe somebody that doesn't really know Bitcoin or average and like, why is this a a moment in time that you think people need to understand? Um, I've been dispelling some of the myths for some time now, but um, someone sent me a series of tweets and some Reddit posts from Mr. Back. And um, Adam Back was basically saying how the worst decision that the community made was uh, appointing Gavin and things like this. Um, he actually said, when we voted in Gavin, there wasn't any, but that, that's a complete egregious lie. I mean, the community never voted Gavin in. The community had nothing to do with this. There was no community decision at all. I was fairly much a dictator and I said how things would be. I mean, I mean, let's, is there an easy way to prove that? Or like, how, what is the logic behind that? Like, what could, how, do you, how is that like factually known? Um, I guess I, I'm a layman on this, is, so I'm asking. There isn't, I mean, the absence of any evidence to the contrary for a start, but there is all Gavin's statements. There's all of what happened on the early forums. There's all of the communications around the time, which was basically, uh, I've just had this dumped on me. Uh, and the way Gavin and there's no proof the for them on this voting claim. Correct. Um, at the have they time, presented? Have they presented proof or a counter there argument? Isn't any. There isn't. Have any. they? Pre- have they presented? Have they tried to present any? 
Oh, no. You, if you're the sort of Soviet Politburo, you don't present truth. I mean, you, you basically sit there saying, you vote for our party because you're voting the right way. I mean, Stalin said he was a democracy. Stalin said, everyone votes for me because they want to. Well, you're they the, the, you're the box, you're, 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 they're making you the bad guy. You know this, right? Of course. Everyone tries to convince me you're the bad guy. I don't, but, honestly, but doesn't I don't Stalin believe convince it. everyone that um, America's the bad guy? I was just telling someone last night. I remember a lesson I learned or somehow I forget who told me. But you look, look, look at the 90s. It's, it's Saddam Hussein. He wants to rally his people. He mm -hmm. puts a picture of George Bush, you know, senior up. And that's the enemy. And then on the other side, it's this guy is the worst. Right. And then people rally around causes. I start to notice as we go into the, the last two weeks of the presidential election, um, Donald Trump running around the country. Now, if you listen to his actual rhetoric, right, it's like in days, it's everywhere he goes is lock her up, lock him up, you know, and, and yeah, I think in, in all aspects of life, I was working on a project today, new person came in all of a sudden. There's this whole new, oh, these people are the worst. Like people try to unify. Sometimes mm -hmm. people's logic is find an enemy, rally everyone against them, and then they'll love me for spotting out the enemy. Like it, life doesn't need to uh, be a zero sum game like that. You can actually that, just focus on adding value. That is the whole postmodern problem. When I said an atavistic reduction to tribalism, that's it. We're going back to the tribal state where neglecting and forgetting logic and basically sitting there going the tribe is right the tribe is right and we're not arguing or debating or analyzing anything anymore by where i mean the majority of society not everyone of course but what are we analyzing now how are we looking at what's right wrong or indifferent so are we looking at policies are we actually investigating the cost? Not just the immediate cost, but the long-term cost. So when we're thinking about um, the current presidential election, not that I get to vote in it, but you should be weighing up, if Joe Biden gets in, this is what it will do for me and my family. This is what it will cost, not just me, but the economy and society and long-term. If Trump gets in, this is what it will cost. This is what it will benefit. And it should be a cost-benefit analysis. But few people have the rhetorical skills, the logical skills, the rational skills to actually be able to sit down and do this anymore. And that's a failing of education. Well, and now, and now even to add another layer to the problem, the data sets are now under contest, right? Like, hmm. you, like uh, the actual information they're being showed can be skewed and, and, and tailored to a certain perspective, amplified by a certain perspective. And really build out that bubble to the point where all common sense kind of goes out of the window. Well, but hey, media, wait. Let, media was Finish once this bipartisan. point, I want to pivot. Go ahead. No, no. Media had to be bipartisan once. Up until Nixon, it, it started changing at Nixon and it was completely killed off by the time Reagan was first in office. The original concept was you had to present both sides of the argument if you're going to do it in, in um, sort of television or whatever else. Um, Nixon started the erosion on that one, uh, thinking that well, I don't want to hear those other things. Uh, we want to just give people my my side, and no one wants to face that. Now the problem is he's actually created his own monster, and the Republican Party now has to face this as well. Um, when you isolate opinion, then you create silos, and nobody has to think about anything other than what they already want to believe, and that basically kills off rational thought. Well, and then I think, again, and as you mentioned earlier, with, I think, social media, right, and, and tech giants, I just think the average person literally has no, I mean, they're like 3% comprehension. I, I keep giving an example to people lately, and I'm like, the best way I can describe it, or, or one way, a new way I've tried to describe it is say, Imagine that you're watching the Super Bowl at your house because, like, Americans just love the Super Bowl. Imagine you're watching the Super Bowl at your house and I'm watching the Super Bowl at my house. And one of the things the Super Bowl is famous for 
is commercials, right? So you're watching the Super Bowl and this Coca-Cola commercial comes up and it's hilarious. And you're texting me saying, did you just see that Coca-Cola commercial? Because they would kind of assume that, that the commercial they're seeing is a commercial that I'm seeing. But I think when they really shift that paradigm and understand that like that they have their own pipe now, right? And, mm-hmm. and I just don't think technologically they understand how quickly these machines are processing this, identifying the actions they're taking, their location, mm-hmm. and, and how very little is left up to coincidence to a certain extent. And, and honestly, it's like, I want to like educate people, but it's just, it's not necessarily easy, right? Like when you're, you know, you don't know how to even write hello world or something, right? Like if you haven't gone that far, it's pretty hard to make, to connect other dots. But hey, let me, let me, let us put, let me get, get us off this for a minute. And I want to actually talk about, I could talk about this topic for a while, but I want to ask you, so let me talk about maybe some, I don't know, you probably theme it negative things. I want to talk about some positive things. So what are you, and I know I've asked you this question before, and I think you're going to be like, what I can tell you, it's like a patent thing, but like, what are you working on? Like, what excites you? If you think out the rest of this year, like, what are you working on? What are you creating? What value are you adding um, to the to the ecosystem, I guess? Well, um, I'm, again, not going to talk about the things that we're patenting. Uh, some of the, the stuff we've just um, got through and is now public are quite interesting. Uh, verifiable computing is uh, something that uh, is the last sort of set of topics that, that came out that are uh, public and we can start discussing it some some detail, not completely yet. Um, the concept there is uh, basically having a, a means of allowing multiple different parties to uh, do a computation that can be verified and, um, and validated. And linked into sale directly on the blockchain. So that would enable uh, individuals to do uh, computation. Uh, a way to imagine if you know anything about something like CUDA, uh, C-U-D-A, um, when you're doing programming for uh, say GPUs and it's massively parallel systems, what we can do is have verifiable um, computation. CUDA, CUDA, CUDA is like the programming language of NVIDIA, right? Is that? Yes. If yeah. I and that and other things too. It's one of them. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. But I think the other one. Anyway, sorry. So where you're talking about thousands and potentially millions, billions of different parallel processes. Um, so it, it's a little bit different to the normal sort of single threaded linear structure that most people get used to on Windows. But that would enable us to have verifiable uh, computation done that can be uh, re-evaluated and, and um, combined, allowing people to actually sell um, sort of the ability to uh, do computations to a wide audience. And most of these things you'll find when you have lots of individuals involved, it's, it's a law of large numbers. So it doesn't matter if one or two people cheat, it matters that in the majority of the system, it's actually correct. And when others can validate what's happening um, and uh, pseudonymously distribute transactions, it means we can start selling uh, individual computations without even knowing who we're computing for necessarily. So that will enable uh, some of these sort of failed concepts that you have in um, Ethereum and whatever else, where they, they think that everyone needs to run everything, which is totally wrong because then effectively you limit everyone to the lowest uh, computer. The whole world ends up as a Raspberry Pi, a single Raspberry Pi. So why do you have multiple machines? So the way to do that is you have to distribute, decentralize even, your computation between many machines. Not you're talking about, you're talking about the distributing, distributing the tasks like yes. in, a, in a parallel way that can be brought back together. Correct. So you don't want everyone running the same thing. You want a verifiable result at the end. Now, in doing that, it allows you to have massive scaling of computation that can be commercially and economically valued, which is one of the aspects of everything I do. It, it has, and and, and it, some, of the major roadblock, some of the major roadblocks there are obviously infrastructure, the power, the, the processing units, and availability, and then it's syncing things up with time and sequence? Not at all. 
<laughs> All right, I love this. No, tell me, this is why I'm asking. <laughs> so none of that matters. Uh, where you have uh, the first correct answer, you don't care about the time. Now, an individual, if they're economically incentivized, is going to actually work to get um, the correct answer to the destination because only the, the first correct answer gets paid. Well, so I guess let, let me actually rephrase. I'm not saying like the, it's not hard to like economically incentivize that, but I'm just saying to prove that theory and keep things in in line or verify as they come in. And I'm probably gonna butcher myself again, but is that like where the technological difficulty lies is doing that in distributed fashion in no. taking everything? All right, no, the, the whole aspect here is people in technology fail to understand economics. All of the problems are economic in nature. They require economic solutions. So this is why people keep going wrong. They, they keep thinking of it as basically an all or nothing system where uh, it needs to work this way. Uh, we can't trust processes. We can't trust um, sort of uh, human rational thought. We, we've got to get the computer doing it. And it's very much the typical um, Silicon Valley basement dwelling um, geek who has no idea of the real world and community. Um, hence why they like sort of um, social justice type um, payment schemes and whatever else, uni uh, universal basic income and things like that. It's really actually analyzing the economics of the system and um, precluding all the bad things economically. All right, so, so the last question here, and I know we're going a little over in that, so I want to I wanna respect your time, but um, what, one kind of bring it to all of this, what you just told me together, and then one like last one. Um, so what is your, and I, I really, I, pro, I believe that like a lot of people just spend so much time focusing on like your larger story that if I were to actually ask of the small amount of people that are quote unquote in blockchain or crypto, then I would take a sample of those people and actually be like, what is he working on today? I mean, I'm guessing less than 5%, less than 3% of people could even attempt to answer. So if you were to kind of put it into a snapshot for them, if you look out, I don't know what your timeline is, but if you look out six months or one year, what do you see actually being implemented from what you're building today? Like what, what like if you were to maybe highlight some ideas of what you think adoption might look like, like I might have the X amount of customers and X amount of users. I don't know how you're measuring what you're doing right now. Or is it in patent is in patents? You got me saying patents now. My accent's changing. Um, but yeah, what what is what is your like what are some landmarks coming up for you? Um nothing I can really discuss, unfortunately. Um, is it user to... growth? Is it adoption? Is it like I mean at a high level? Like, None of the above. Uh, nothing I can discuss. All right, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm not like the um, uh, the typical crypto promoter. Uh, most no, of no, the, no. Most I, of the I, things I can't talk from about. Like a high right level. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, you know me. I, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm just actually like, I want to like see like I want to. I've been trying to measure things this year. I'm, I'm realizing like actually watching and progression. Like we started this event as like. 2020 seems crazy let's like actually talk every month as much as possible and, and kind of trace it back right um but it, i can tell you things are happening i can't tell you what they are yeah fair enough all right so i'll let you kind of think out. but i have one thing do you know this guy the, the dave portnoy like the barcel sports like pizza guy do you know who this is barcel the pizza guy sorry barcel he does the pizza reviews he did like an interview with like, uh, anyways, he's hilarious. You should watch him one day. He seems like a really good guy. And he's just crazy. He basically doesn't give a shit what anyone believe or thinks. I think kind of similar to you. Um, it was pretty successful very quick. And people actually like pay attention to what he says. But he, he kind of started watching crypto the other day and cut, it jumped in. He had a decent cult following. And he, if you, again, hard pressed to believe that you haven't seen him, but I'll take that one for now. So, but he sat down with like the Winklevoss twins and then like Pomp the other day. I think he's actually, and then like immediately got into a war with like the chain link army, right? Cause he's like calling them out. And within days of this, you're like flipping them off on the interview I did with you. I think he actually wants to understand crypto. I think he's pretty smart. 
if we would you be willing to like explain this to him one day? I think yeah, it might definitely. be the best. I, but I wouldn't call it crypto. Ever... That's the first problem. Or sorry, I mean, sorry, I, sorry. I've yeah. used that term before um, after, in the early days, but um, because other people convinced me that it was a good good term and whatever else, but um, I should have thought more about it. I don't. Uh, I didn't call it a cryptocurrency system when I wrote the paper because it's not. So what do you? Well, how, how would you define core it? What, what, should I, what should we tell him? What do you want to explain to Dave Portnoy? It's a digital I, I cash up, system. I want to put up $5,000 in charity because I think it was going to be, you guys it's are going to end up It's a digital cash friend. system. It's a digital Sorry. cash system. So Dave Portnoy, and I want to confirm with you, Craig, mm -hmm. you will spend 45 minutes one day if he has time explaining it to him. Yeah, no, I, I happily do that. All right, check him out. And like, I trust me, I think you'll see what I see. I think he's actually a pretty cool guy. And I think he's not scared to tell people what he thinks. But all right, thank you for the time. This is a broad conversation. I wish I could like talk for another hour. Um, before we go out, what, what's I don't know? Like, what are you looking forward to the next few months? Life, personally, professionally? Um, being able to travel again <laughs> properly without restrictions with normal people, normal restaurants, restaurants that don't have cut down mem uh, menus, normal life, uh, people. Uh, finally getting sick of the fear and going, screw it. That would be good. Well, I hope you get it. It's weird in Thailand. It's like it's gone now. I mean, really, like, we, it doesn't... I've been talking to friends lately, and it's... it's. I almost feel like I'm starting to become insensitive because I was there, like, a few months ago, like, in lockdown, you know, but now it's just not crossing my mind, like... But, yeah. Mm. It's... This much time goes on with people locked up, and I mean, people are going to start going crazy at some point. No, I, think. I think they're already starting to get there. I mean, yeah. yeah. Oh, I have final question. What is your prediction for the U.S. election, which I think is 14 days away? What do you think is going to happen? I think it's going to be close. Do you think that even if it's close, do you think it'll be contested? Do you think there'll be flare-ups around the contestion? I think that's uh, quite possible, yes. Do I think that's a good thing? No. It will, that leads to instability. So, yeah. Got it. Well, Craig, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think you know I appreciate it. Uh, everybody watching, let's keep going. I don't know what point we're at in this conference. Happy Halloween. I know this is when this is getting broadcast. Uh, Craig Wright, I think it's my fourth interview with him. Still love this guy. Want to talk to him more. Craig Wright, Patrick McLean. Craig, have, have a good, good day, day, yeah? You too.